Charity overwhelmingly was ecclesiastically based. It was church. Rich people gave to their church. About 110 years ago, some rich people started their secular foundations, Carnegie, Ford, Rockefeller. And so that went into, that was a, a second stage version of philanthropy. And then later on, some of those foundations and a lot of others began funding advocacy groups. They would fund, or fund some public interest law firms like Ford, Ford Foundation did in the 1960s and 70s. They helped start NRDC. Or they would contribute money to NAACP or ACLU and local, local uh, groups too. But by and large, most of the money went into soft charity, not advocating justice. There is a difference between charity and justice. The metaphor is charity starts soup kitchens, justice asks why is there hunger in America and try to get to the root of it. Charity ministers to people in need, which is important when you're hungry, you're not philosophizing, you want a meal. Charity ministers to people in need, clinics, etc. But justice deals with prevention of the forces in motion that produce such terrible human tragedies. And so some of the money now, the big money, is moving into an arena that you might call advocacy philanthropy. For example, the Gates Foundation wants to fund vaccines to deal with malaria and AIDS, etc. Prevention. Others, other rich people pour a lot of money into politics. But how many rich, very rich people put money into organizing for justice? What, what one might be called muscle money. Let's call it muscle money. Well, here, here's an example of muscle money. Medical marijuana would never have been enacted in the state, starting in California, without Peter Lewis and George Soros putting up probably $30 million. Never would have been. Whatever you feel about that. That was muscle money. Muscle money was Mayor Bloomberg taking on the NRA and beating it on an issue in Congress recently. That took a few million bucks. That's muscle money. Muscle money in history has been proper Bostonians and New Yorkers putting money in the abolition against slavery movement or putting money in the civil rights movement, the Stern family and the Curry family in the 50s and 60s in the early stages put a lot of money in the civil rights movement. But we need to take it to a new level. There have never been more enlightened, elderly, super rich people in our history. And you can say 99% of the super rich are narcissistic and they're just concerned about themselves and their circle and their leisure in their advanced age and they don't really care about the world or the country. But if you stereotype them 100% instead of 99%, you're missing something very important. If someone could have persuaded George Soros to put that money in opposing the Iraq war, we would not have had an Iraq war. And what Joe Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winner, says is $3 trillion of its eventual cost, and over a million Iraqis dead, and their country blown apart, and more insurgents spreading around the world, and of course our soldiers dying, and coming back brutalized and sick, and traumatized. The people in this book, and they did everything I ordered them to do, by the way. <laughs> the people in this book knew they couldn't do it by themselves. They couldn't get the first base. They had to be top down, bottom up. Now I know it's wonderful to say, when the masses arise, someday the people will organize. Someday they'll march to critical mass levels. Someday they'll take back their government. Someday they'll take on Wall Street. Yes, we will. 
Yes, we will. And we can, and we can continue uh, believing that. But if we don't have the resources to do it, how many decades are we going to wait? And I've seen plenty of years go by where the most outrageous increments and magnitudes of injustice that we would never dream would occur now back in the 60s. Like corporate crime in the 60s was tiddlywinks compared to what it is now. Consumer debt, the albatross, student debt, poverty, all of these things, uninsured people, all of these things are worse. A corrupt Congress beyond belief. You can't even call it Capitol Hill. We call it Withering Heights. <laughs> so, so when is it going to happen? You had the collapse of Wall Street, the greatest demonstrable greed in American history, and power, and self-serving. They tanked their own companies so they could get their own riches off. And it was all front page, folks. It was all on the national news. Nobody covered this up once it broke. They weren't reporting it while it happened. Lehman Brothers, for example, and Merrill Lynch. When it broke, it was all front page news. Where are the people? We had the only rally in our presidential campaign. We had the only rally on Wall Street in October. It filled that space. Some of you helped organize it. And it was all we could do to get a 680-word article deep in the section of the New York Times. And this was a major issue of the day, including the New York Times recognizing it. They wouldn't even put it on page one or in the A section. It never made the local TV, never mind national. We don't have our own media. It's one thing to expose 60-minute style injustices. But if anybody tries to do about it, they're shut out of the media. If anybody says, hey, I just uh, saw this 60 minute thing I'm going to organize around the country. Hey, 60 minutes, six months later, put us on. You don't get on. If you say, hey, this is a great page one story that the New York Times had recently. Uh, we're going to organize around it. They don't report civic activity. So we have to have the resources. Now, this is a grand approach, but it can be broken down into injustices in your own society, in your own community, in your own city. Take New York. You know, just list 10, 15, 20 issues that you'd like to have turned around. How would it, how would it be if 10 million, 15, 20, 50, 100 million were put behind this? And think of the gratification. These people never had a better time. It was the greatest year of their life and they were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And once you, agree, once you accept the predicate of super-rich, enlightened, older people putting their money behind this type of effort, every page in this book could happen. Every page in this book could happen. And everything that happened in this book, and the country came alive, the country was aroused, there wasn't an area of the country that wasn't touched. Fifteen billion dollars. The moment the media realized that there was super rich older people taking on the big CEOs and they had their own media, guess what? They gave them free media every day. Money begets media. There was a point here when Warren Buffett reflected that everything that was spent here was a third of his net worth. I know that this uh, approach is subject to skepticism, but it's happened in our history on a smaller scale, and I mentioned some examples. It's happening to some respects here on a small uh, scale, but it's all a matter of scale. A million dollars wouldn't have have done enough for those 300 ex-generals, diplomats, and security people retired. $10 million would have done something. $300 million would have been decisive in those six-month period. 
And that's what we have to do. We have to raise our expectation level and say to the enlightened, elderly, super rich, we would like to have you exercise your civic responsibilities in accordance with your wealth. When you have someone like William Gates Sr. who organized with Chuck Collins a thousand super rich people five years ago to stop the Republicans from repealing the estate tax, they were engaged in a conflict against their own material interests. These are super rich people saying you should tax estates. So we can see it. It has happened and it has been successful on a small scale. We want to try to make it on a big scale. And let me just end on, on, on this note. We can have a, a discussion. Today, as we speak, in Congress, they're figuring how they're going to regulate Wall Street. Can you imagine it's, it's been almost two years since Bear Stearns, and they still haven't passed anything. When Unsafe and Any Speed came out, this book came out in November 30th, 1965. It was page one, New York Times. In nine months, arguably the most powerful industry in the United States was brought under federal regulation. Safety and efficiency, fuel efficiency. Nine months, Lyndon Johnson signed the bill. Harry Truman proposed universal health insurance in the 1940s. We still don't have it. Financial regulation was ripped apart as it was established by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1999 under Clinton and Robert Rubin. And two years, two years after the collapse that looted and drained trillions of dollars of regular people's money, savings, pensions, mutual funds, and millions of lost jobs, nothing has gone through Congress. There is nothing out there in the district. 535 people run by a handful of Wall Street firms who have no votes? Shame on, shame on us. We should be ashamed of ourselves. And that's the way I want to end. Congress, Congress, Congress is the fastest way to start turning our country around as if people mattered first. And business were their servants, not their masters. Congress is the most powerful branch of government under our Constitution. It turns over or could turn over faster, certainly, than the executive and judicial branches. It can be made very sensitive to what Abraham Lincoln called the public sentiment. As he said, without the public sentiment, you can't do much. But with the public sentiment, you can do anything. And to the young people here, let me just warn you, do not be trivialized by technological gadgets. You're destroying the most idealistic formative years of your life, your teenage life, unless you understand what's happening to you beyond your sensual pleasures. And there's no more clever, essential institution in the history of the world than the modern marketing corporation. And they will turn your tongue against your brain and kind of the food you eat, and they'll block out your better natures in trivial pursuits of this gadgetry. We've lost almost lost the connection with the young generation. And parents know what I'm talking about. And that's our future. And that's what we have to pay attention to in terms of bringing them into a capability of engaging our democratic society when they are at their peak of their incipient idealism and they are willing to ask the impertinent questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, after he's signing books, they have to beat it down to DC, so we'll only be able to take about seven questions, so. Well, it's nice to be able to address everyone. Ralph, uh, oh, you that mentioned way. that uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, is, is he one of the people in your book? No, he isn't. Why? That's an important question for you to answer the New York City people here because he has about $22 billion now, and I'm sure he gives some to charity, but uh, he just asked us to give money for the Haitian poor people that were earthquaked, and I would like you to address what you want us to do with Mayor Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. He, he's not one of the 17 in the book. There is no public official in the book. Um, on the marijuana point, Mexico's being ripped apart with the drug wars. 70% of the profits of the drug lords is marijuana sold in this country. The drug lords are moving into this country. They're getting plots, areas to cultivate. They're in 230 cities. This is madness. We've got to decriminalize and regulate uh, marijuana. We do have criminals in the Senate. We do have criminals in the Congress. We do have criminals in the White House. We have criminals in every government agency. And they are so insane that they have no idea what they're doing to themselves and families all over this planet. We, human animals, cannot exist for much longer on this planet because we're allowing the criminals to pollute our planet more and more. Our oceans are filled with plastics that are deadly. We have only about 10 to 15 percent of the fish that we had. We're nuts. When are we going to put those, you know what the words are, in prison? Okay. Um, it's, good. it's a good way to achieve prison reform, too. They can't stand the food. Uh, uh, let me give you an example uh, per per pertinent to the theme here tonight. <clears throat> Every congressional district has active citizens. They often don't know each other. They all have community colleges and colleges. 2,000 people in each congressional district, which has about 630,000 people, men, women, and children, every congressional district. 2,000 people organized with a 400,000 budget, two offices in each district, with 200 volunteer hours a year from each of the 2,000, could completely transform Congress like that, even before the next election. I say this because I have fought Congress, lobbied Congress, going all over the country, 50 states, over again. I know what it takes. If these people developed an agenda that's generally supported by the public sentiment, like examples I gave, it would be very rapid. Do you know how much that costs? Let's assume these people volunteer 200 hours a year focusing on Congress and the redirection agenda. Let's assume they're not contributing a dollar. The entire budget for something like that is 400,000 times 435. You can figure that out. Say it's $200 million. You know, you can name 300 people who wouldn't feel that. Jerome Kohlberg, the big mergers and acquisitions mogul who quit, he got sick of it, his passion is campaign electoral reform, campaign finance. He put in a few million and hired some good people. Nothing happened. What if you put 300 million in? What if you organized each congressional district? You want to have basic change on foreign, military, and domestic policy? You have to take control of Congress. And the public sentiment is, is based on a far greater consensus than some of the cable talk show hosts uh, are reflecting. There's a far greater public consensus on major changes in this country. 
And it's a consensus about shift of power. Every major social justice movement in this country was preceded by a shift of power, whether it's anti-slavery, women's right to vote, environment, labor, you name it, farmer. And whether you call yourself conservative or liberal, you want to have, you want to be able to decide, you want to have the people decide. You don't want some corporations in Tokyo and New York and Chicago and London decide for you and make your government your adversary. So always bring it down to scale and just work out of your own neighborhood. See what major change you'd like in your neighborhood and begin to open up the opportunity to talk with some of these very rich, older, enlightened people. Uh, the dialogue in this book is very realistic in terms of the people I selected. I, I read their biographies, I read their speeches. They didn't just, you know, emerge in a fictional role without any antecedents. And you will see that as their power grew through the people, as the people power grew, their opponents began fracturing, even intellectually. Not just their power began fracturing. They began fracturing in terms of the way they saw themselves and what they were doing. And that's what good power does. Good power has remarkable impact on bad power, other than defeating it. Yes. Yes. Mr. Nader, um, assuming that there were one of these rich, older, enlightened, wealthy persons willing to put up the money to turn around the economy or to begin to turn it around, how much would be needed and exactly what would the money go towards doing to accomplish this end? <clears throat> well, you, you want the healthcare industry, you have the financial industry, you have the energy industry, you have the real estate industry. There are uh, legislation now before Congress that could reflect pretty fundamental turnarounds. Uh, instead, they're being shorn down and shredded as we speak uh, by the corporate lobbyists who have no popular opponents organized back home or on Capitol Hill. The same is true with the tax system. So that's what I would do. Congress, Congress, Congress. Congress can be used as a tool to turn around these situations, but also as a tool to devolve power to devolve power from the few to the many. We've got a lot of that worked out. A lot of that is in the book. If you, you read this book, you'll come out feeling stronger as a citizen. You'll never be as reluctant uh, ever in asking rich people for money. <laughs> a lot of funny scenes here. And uh, you'll want to do more person-to-person -person conversations with your neighbors and others of like-minded uh, Ben. Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes read this on her vacation, and she wrote me a letter saying she found it engrossing, creative, and funny. I said, I'll take all three, given the size. Anyway, that's my answer to you, is that they, we're organized that way. I mean, you may not like the way we're organized in the federal system, uh, but if we don't take this huge boulder off the highway called Congress and you know, get it moving, uh, we won't be able to devolve power as fast as we have to. And as one of the former questioners pointed out, there's a real sense of urgency here. The decay of our democratic processes is accelerating like a glacier that spins off a little more and more and then more and more. You, it's accelerating by the year. I mean, it's, nobody would ever have dreamed you could have corporate criminality on Wash, Wall Street tanking the economy and nothing's been legislated for 24 months. Yes. Somewhere, excuse me, somewhere, Mr. Nader, I think there's a flaw in this thesis. Um, you're suggesting that these people who have amassed fortunes because the system allows them to would be ethical enough to use that money um, in a way that would benefit us all? Why haven't they already? Mr. Soros, why hasn't he used some of that money? Mr. Gates, all of these people. It, it's, to me, 
immoral to be able to uh, amass that kind of money. That means that their services were too uh, expensive or they didn't pay their employees enough. Um, I don't trust the morality of someone who has that much money and doesn't use it. All right, I'm you're, sure you're, they you're. know of your book. Why hasn't someone said, let me uh, be the first? And why endorse people like that? If, if they're in charge, does, does that mean that we should all look forward to uh, becoming multimillionaires in order to be good citizens? Well, that's why I want you to read this book. Because I, I had the same uh, skepticism. You're right 99% of the time uh, with 90% of these people. Don't stereotype 100% especially when they're in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They have a different perspective, these few, and you don't need that many. That's the point. There can be 10,000 of them that are disgustingly super rich, but two dozen of them can make the difference. That's one. And, uh, and the second is, George Soros you know, opened a lot of citizen activities in Eastern Europe and Russia, and he's He's funded a lot of, through the Open Society Institute, a lot of uh, institutional development, not charity so much, institutional. He gives his share of charity, some of his charity. But the point is that they are amateurs also in terms of social change. And we've got to try, when we've got those kinds of people against the Iraq War, 300 X this, that, military, diplomatic, so on. We've got to try to bring the resources to, to bear on it. Probably it never occurred to George Soros that $300 million would have stopped the Iraq War. But maybe nobody gave him a $300 million idea. Now you're right in a sense, I tried to call him and I didn't get my calls returned <laughs> in 2002 because he stereotypes me as someone who challenges the Democratic Party. But that doesn't mean other people couldn't have gotten to him. The other thing is, they really go out of business. They devolve power so that people recover their civic self-confidence or achieve their civil self-confidence and begin sustaining these groups by themselves. Because when you come down to it, it's a pittance. I mean, what's $200 million grassroots organizing every year focusing on Congress? I mean, that's nothing for lots of ordinary people to pitch in. Think what they spend on, you know, alcohol or trivia. So we got to show them that it doesn't take that much. It's a whole new way of thinking uh, 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 of the possibilities of popular sovereignty. But to shoehorn the getting it underway, why not try to get these people who have done some good things in their life and they don't want to see their country head for the pits before they leave this earth to get them locked in to well-prepared, credible civic and political campaigns. That's the, the way to do it. Because I know I've heard a lot of feedback on this book just as you described it. But give it a chance. Don't forget that ask yourself, once you accept the predicate of this, and these people plan to go out of business. They plan to go out of business. They planned for self-sustaining civic um, mobilization, whether it couldn't happen if the money was there. So, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. While energy activists do a good job promoting alternatives, they frequently fail to mention the enormous government subsidies for coal, oil, and worst of all, the open-ended commitment to nuclear power. Uh, w when I explain the Price-Anderson Act to people, when people realize that the nuclear power industry has a single-payer government-sponsored low-cost system for limiting their liability, they get angry. Uh, your thoughts on 
corporate welfare and a, a level playing field in the energy business? Well, half of what Washington does is corporate welfare. It's shoveling out subsidies, handouts, market protections, bailouts. They give away our natural resources. You know, there's no country in the world that gives away its gold, silver, molybdenum, so-called hard rock me metals uh, for nothing. Did you know that? On our public lands, any company, foreign or, or US, can send its geologists onto the land with a permit. If they discover gold, and it's, say, $9 billion worth of gold that a Canadian company discovered on public land, our land in Nevada, uh, over a decade ago. Now, just, this is a great example. $9 billion of our gold was discovered by this Canadian company, Barrick. And under the 1872 Mining Act in our country, all they had to do was figure out how many acres over the gold mine they needed to own, take the maps and the proof of the gold to the Department of Interior in Washington, and they got it for $30,000, $5 an acre, 1872 price. And all the gold that they're selling, no royalties back to Uncle Sam. And when they finished the mine and it got the cyanide lace waste, you and I pick it up in terms of the taxpayer. No country in the world gives that away. No third world country, no country in the world. Now, as this questioner pointed out, if that was part of political campaigns, you think a conservative wouldn't be upset with that? A liberal wouldn't be upset with that? It's nonsense. There, there comes levels of such severe injustice and outrage that these so-called differences melt away. Just like if there is invasion from Mars, I think some of the differences on Earth would sort of diminish. So uh, the, the fossil fuel nuclear heavily subsidized by your tax money and limited liability, Price-Anderson Act, and so on, and Obama just sent up $54 billion of loan guarantee proposals to Congress for nuclear plants. And it's a total non-starter. Nuclear plants are being beaten every day in the world by renewable energy like wind power on economic cost alone and by energy efficiency. They're losing every day in the marketplace to that. Uh, but, but their power over a large number of 535 members of Congress, and our lack of organization, no Congress watch locals back home, keeps this outrage going and growing. So that's, that's what we have to face. The key is never to be discouraged. The, the nature of a civic personality is to be immune from discouragement. That your last defeat is your best teacher, your last mistake is your best professor. That's who you, you got. Just like in athletics, there are several people in the NBA as skilled as Michael Jordan. They could jump and shoot and defend just as good as he could. The difference was his mental determination to win in the last part of the game. See, that, that's what's called an athletic personality. We have to, got to develop in the schools a civic personality by having our schools exposed to children from a young age when they're so fresh and eager to, to civic skills engagement in their community. So they learn in school by learning what's going on in their community, in their city hall, in their supermarkets, and etc. That's what's needed because otherwise the more that's disclosed about where this country's heading here and around the world, 90% of the people listen to it and they get totally demoralized, tune out, drop out, and just try to make it through the day with their own private lives, which get worse and worse because their public lives are being snuffed out by powerful corporate con uh, concentration of power. Yes. Hi, Mr. Nader. Um, what are your ideas on banking reform, particularly with the Federal Reserve? How does those ideas 
differ from Ron Paul and Alex Jones and the right wing? Um, if you could just clearly explain the difference, because you both have problems with the current system, but I just need a clearer, you know, is the Federal, is the Federal Reserve totally demonic? <laughs> Thank you. The, the Federal Reserve is a government within a government. It has enormous power over the money supply and other aspects of the economy. It has now expanded its power in terms of the Wall Street guarantee bailout. And it doesn't uh, rely on congressionally appropriated funds. It's funded by bankers, fees on the banks. There are 12 branches of the Federal Reserves, Philadelphia, New York, Dallas, etc., And they're all dominated by the banks. So it's basically the banker's government. And, Saul, and, and Ron Paul wants to abolish it. And it should be abolished, but it should be replaced with a cabinet level central bank. We're not quite ready for local currency, and the gold standard is far too restrictive. Uh, so if we're going to have a central bank, it should be accountable to Congress, should be open, much more open. There should be far more representation of borrowers, consumers, uh, workers, etc. Now, I mean, let's put it this way. The Federal Reserve is too important to be run by bankers alone. So, I don't know what his proposal is. I know he does want to abolish it, uh, but sometimes, you know, he, he, he verges on anarchical philosophy, which can be very sophisticated. The question is, are people ready for anarchy? No, I don't think people are ready for anarchy. You know, Oscar Wilde once declared that socialism will never work because it requires too many meetings. Well. Let's put it this way. How many of you have been part of consumer co-ops who are on the edge because there's not enough participation by the consumers who own the co-ops, right? And, you know, if we want to control our economy, we have to put time in. We can't basically say we want, we want ultimate convenience uh, for the production and distribution of our goods and services and, and still control it without putting time in. Yes. Um, I, I commend you for presenting a very um, original or, or interesting approach to trying to support activism. Uh, I don't think, I think, would you welcome, however, the formation of a, a group of people that you would coordinate with to introduce other perspectives? Because I think if you look historically, the, we've had the white man's burden, we've had great um, sort of rationalizations, or let's do something for these people, and it's been merely a means to increase power. And power is really at the heart of this. Uh, you have a group of people on top who've got a lovely system going of strange banking regulations, which, which give them lots of money, and why should they give up the game? We don't want just charity to keep people like in Haiti, because you want to be able to change, as you said, you made a good point there, change people's lives. So have you, have you any um, intent to try to expand? I think the main thing that is our problem today is that we're in the middle of two paradigms. And we still think in terms of leadership and, and a mainframe control of everything, instead yeah. of believing in bottoms up. And it, it, it's a oh. belief and a, and a way of life that has to gradually um, be developed in order to get the, the kind of um, non-centralized change that, that will really do the trick. Precisely what they, uh, they did. They, they saw leadership as finding existing leaders in the community who never got any support and brought them out to the public stage and gave them support. So their definition of leadership was to create more leaders. And they were going out of business. I mean, they were in their 80s and 90s. See, we're not using the advanced age of wisdom <laughs> that comes with a small number, a small number of, uh, of super rich people. You know, how many, there, there's probably nobody here who hasn't been involved in some civic struggle, some community battle, okay? And probably there's no one here who hasn't lost some of them, right? Now, when you lose them, and it's over, you know, it's an election or it's an agency decision or whatever. 
What goes through your mind? You say, if only, if only, if only. You say, if only we had more media. If only we had more organizers in the field. If only we had more money. Does that go through your mind? If only we had better strategy and we could tap into some chemistry experts to document that what was in our drinking water was really harmful, but we didn't, couldn't afford it. Or we couldn't afford the lab tests. And that's what this book is. It answers the question, if only. And it does it in a grand scheme, and it uses the strategy of surprise, which is very important. Always remember this. You want to get a powerful interest overcome. Do not stretch it out. Look at like healthcare. Because the more it's delayed, the more the corporations learn how to game the system, how to divide and rule, how to obfuscate, and above all, how to delay. One so one of the lessons in this book is what happens when there's very fast and well-funded civic mo mobilization against the power structure. But again, always ask yourself, after you lose a battle, what if, what if, what if? And a lot of the what ifs could be resolved if there are some enlightened, advanced, very wealthy people in your community who decided to engage their civic responsibilities on something they agree with you on. Now someone said, what if it was done on the other side against the people? Hey, I have, a, I have an answer for that. It's already being done. <laughs> That's why we're in this kind of thing. It is being done against us. The rich are funding all kinds of forces and, and ultimatums and all the rest in the councils of government and elsewhere against the public interest. Now, it's time for the valiant people who are struggling in community after community to see that maybe they can have some big, powerful people behind them taking on the big boys. I've seen too many failures because people just didn't have the resources. In Appalachia, mountaintop removal. Look at the coal industry and its billions of dollars and its influence in Congress. And you have basically a few dozen valiant people who are struggling with peanuts to bring it to public attention and to put pressure on Congress and, and Obama to stop it. And you see that everywhere. You see it in the in, in, in the old cotton mills of people dying from the, the, in the dust in the carting rooms in South Carolina and North Carolina. They had nobody behind them. But we have to change that. Yes. And they got arrogant. Uh, and then they started covering up. First they started to blame the driver. And they started blaming the floor mat. There was some floor mat interference, uh, but that's, you know, that's the way they placed it. Uh, and then they said, well, it's mechanical. And now more and more engineering types think it's more electronic, electronic throttle, microprocessors. More and more we're losing control of driving to what's called the computer on wheels, namely our, our automobile. It's becoming more and more computerized, not just in acceleration and braking and so forth. So this is going to be a healthy development, minus the terrible tragedies, because it's going to focus on the electronics of the modern automobile, the total takeover of an agency I helped create, NHTSA, the Auto Safety Agency and Department of Transportation. Now uh, there'll be more congressional support for NHTSA and more budget. I've said on uh, television recently that the, the motor vehicle safety budget in NHTSA to deal with 42,000 deaths a year in America and hundreds of thousands of injuries on the highway is $140 million. We are spending this year guarding the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, Iraq, $675 million pursuant to a criminal war of aggression. We shouldn't even be there. 
So you see where our priorities are? You've got the American people here. They need te safety technologies and mandatory safety standards and recalls, et cetera, and good government research. And uh, it's not there. We're over there. They talk about this health care bill the Democrats have. The Republicans are beating them daily. Oh, it's a trillion dollars over 10 years. That's less than what we spent in Iraq. This is, you know, <laughs> you save a lot of lives here when you have people with health insurance. So, I always say, without fire in the belly, we don't get anywhere. It doesn't matter how much we know. We have to care enough to change our daily routine and our own personal priorities. And uh, that's, that's what's done it for the early people who formed our trade unions in the steel and auto industry and Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. A lot of people knew what these people knew. These people had fire in their belly. That's the key. It's called emotional intelligence, by the way, now by the psychologists. Yes. Hello, Mr. Nader. My name is Danny Morgan, and this is Vinod Kumar, and we're high school students. Even without um, the shaping of public opinion by the rich, do you believe that a massive social and ideological revolution is on the horizon? I, I can't hear you. Can you get a little oh, closer? Sorry. Um, even without the shaping of public opinion by the rich, do you believe that a massive ideological and social revolution is on the horizon? No, I don't. I don't. I look at Bangladesh, for example, or Haiti. It's amazing the absorptive capacity for pain and injustice that people can absorb. And um, I don't even see the level of direct action in nonviolent civil disobedience comparable to the 60s, even though the outrages in many ways, apart from the civil rights, are much greater. I don't know what's happening to the television generation, the color television generation, the video game generation, the internet generation. I don't know what's happening to them except they don't show up. They do not show up. You have great lecturers going around universities. They used to pack uh, the university halls. They're lucky if they can get a, a fourth of the hall full. And um, it doesn't matter where they're coming from. The students do not show up. The level of ignorance of history is, is beyond description. I was just talking to some students who are deep in the environmental activity. They never heard of Barry Commoner. You know, he was the leading environmentalist in the 70s. You'd think you'd know a little history, right? You'd think you'd know that he wrote one of the greatest books ever on environmentalism called Making Peace with the Planet that's relevant as ever today. Never heard of him and they're working in the environmental area. So we've got a serious problem here. Uh, and I, I don't see it. I mean, look, never confuse hope with your sense of reality. Because we can all hope, and I could have answered your question, yes, you know, the ferment everywhere, people are upset, look at the public opinion polls. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not there. Now, it could be there in one neighborhood erupts and changes something, whatever. But I mean, in terms of national movements of gravity that sustain themselves, or even just win one national victory, it's not there. Ask your member of Congress. Ask him if, if any of the people back home have basically turned the tide in Congress against any of the powerful industry lobbyists working it every day. They can't even do the student loan business. Although I think they may finally break through on that. But are the campuses alive on that? No, because they don't have to pay their student loan until they graduate. So they can play video games in State College, Pennsylvania. So I don't see it. I don't see it unless it's funded. You want massive rallies against Wall Street? Millions of dollars will bring out hundreds of thousands of people from the greater New York metropolitan area. It takes buses, it takes organizers, it takes people to, who, who know logistics, who can deal with the police, it takes media people. Pardon? 
It what? It did not take oh, it did not take that in the 60s. You're right, the 60s are not today. Today, you have a full generation and a half of people who don't even know what a teach-in is, who wouldn't even know what to do in a march, who wouldn't know how to do a poster of the content. They would know how to do a, you know, in top, desktop publishing. They have no, they hardly know what Eugene Debs did in history. They, they couldn't tell you three civil rights leaders in the 60s. And let me tell you, the civil rights had something going for it that the injustices don't. It's quite different, you know, when you can't drink from a fountain, you can't go to a school in your neighborhood, and you can't sit at a lunch counter. That's very visceral, very inhumane, very outrageous. And it's more likely to get people angry. But now, it's done on a much, much more abstract and pervasive way. If someone stole your pension, just as you were bringing it from a bank, you'd get pretty angry. But Wall Street steals your pension. Six stages removed. It's different. Let me give you an example of what happens. Arguably, the most effective mass movement in America today is animal rights. You know why? Because it's right in the inner consciousness of people's experience about how animals are treated. Uh, both industrial animals, you know, chickens and pigs and so on, and pets. But once it gets a bit more remote and a bit more abstract, which is the modern corporation's genius, they can manipulate you by remote control. Pretty soon they'll be able to do it technologically. <laughs> um, I mean, they're owning your genes, for heaven's sake. They're patenting your gene sequences. Modern form of slavery on the way. So, I don't think so. I hope, I hope I'm proven wrong, but if we don't face reality, we won't change it. I've told you 16 different ways. And if you just read this book and get some ideas that will devolve into your neighborhood, Congress, Congress, Congress is the start. They control the money, the taxes, and the corporations control them. They control foreign military policy. That's where it is. It, it shouldn't be that way. That's where it is. You've got to control it to, to devolve it, control it to redirect budgets, control it. They're shutting down schools. They're shutting down civil jury trials in state after state. While the military industrial complex is getting hundreds of billions of dollars for massive weapon systems designed for the Soviet Union era of hostility. And they're shutting down a quarter of the schools in Kansas City as we speak. They're selling government buildings in, in Phoenix. They, they've just sold state office buildings. They're on their way to sell the legislature. Of course, metaphorically, it was sold a long time ago because of the budget deficit. Lou Lappin would like to have a, a conference of some of these enlightened super rich at Columbia University. Are you here, Lou? Yeah. And, you know, you can get there. Call them up at, if you have any ideas. They don't have to be super, super rich. Just rich is enough. Because the rich know the super rich. And get them, uh, uh, get them together. You can contact Lou at... Uh, Lapham's Quarterly, L-A-P-H-A-M-S Quarterly, and their website. I mean, here's someone who can get his calls returned, but it's nice to be part of a, a gathering, and one thing leads to another. You get it in Columbia, maybe you'll get it in Seattle. Frank is good. He keeps us on there. We just uh, left Jesse Ventura.